so I think we, when we started, Laura was talking about wandering around. <laughs> well, the map that Antonio shared is a little sobering <laughs> in terms of uh, vaccination at the rate things are going. And when, you know, uh, the world will see um, mostly vaccinated will be 2023. <laughs> <clears throat> so who knows what kind of trouble is <clears throat> possible, not possible. And <clears throat> Anyway, um, FYI, uh, at least on the fantasy level, uh, perhaps, uh, not perhaps, I'm going to draw up two plans for the fantasy of 2022. Um, one will be around towards the end of January of 2022. That will be uh, Southeast Asia, uh, the Lunar New Year uh, in Malaysia. And then possibly to Vietnam and Cambodia. Not sure yet what the other two places around that area might be. Uh, that will be around the so Lunar New Year in Malaysia would be good because that's my territory and so uh, I'll be able to know what kind of you know Lunar New Year uh, things that you're gonna see uh, <clears throat> then uh, 2022 in the summer June July June, July 2022 uh, is uh, Dugong Til. I think I've mentioned this before. So you can pencil into your calendar and <laughs> expect to see like sign ups open, you know, if nothing else for fantasy, it feels good to sign up and say, Ooh, <laughs> and then we'll see <laughs> what collective karma is going to look like. <laughs> So now, uh, Gongchik, uh, five, uh, 14 and 515, right? So we've completed uh, 5, 14 and 15. They basically say the same point. And then between the two, the first one is very famous. And many other uh, Tibetan teachers would quote that quote. Uh, I think Bhattu Rinpoche, especially when they are talking about Ngundra, uh, the way we think of Ngundra today, you know, the hundred thousands. Uh, although in this early period, there is no, I would say, rather artificial number given, like do a hundred thousand this, a hundred thousand that. It's basically, you know, practice your foundations until you are convinced that, you know, you are stable in your foundations. Your guru is convinced that you are stable in your foundations. Then you might build something else on top of that foundation. So Ngundra in this early day, and also Ngundra practice in this early day is a more general term for getting your foundations firm, right? your foundations. Right? It doesn't necessarily refer to a set of fixed practices. The set of fixed practices really came later. Right? In a way, in the absence of like um, uh, a teacher that you can consult with, on the one hand, the absence of such teachers, 
easily accessible. That you have to understand, you know, that's the issue. And then with increasing numbers of people wanting to do the practice, so you have a staffing issue, so to say. <laughs> you have a staffing issue, as in not enough teachers to go around. Uh, so then over time, you know, systems of practice, uh, more and more codified systems of practice came into use. Then before long, you know, everybody who wants to do practice, wants to do retreat, uh, put through the kind of the retreat machine, so to say, uh, the retreat assembly line. <laughs> oh, you do this, then do this, then do this, then do this, you know, a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand. There's no evidence of this in Gampopa's time. There's no evidence of this in Pamudrupa's time, Jitya Sungan's time. Probably a few more generations after that, also no evidence of this approach. Right? Instead, it's all very um, in response to the needs of who is being trained. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, so then you know when it says you know uh, fourteen. Uh, so literally, it says, I mean, not literally here, it says, when, what is profound for others is not profound for us. What is not profound for others is profound for us. So then we have to remember this, that Ngundra, in the sense of the more general sense of like foundation, that our, the foundation for our practice needs to be stable. Stabilizing that foundation, I can tell you, is a lifelong endeavor. In that sense, we are always uh, never leaving this foundation. This foundation is, uh, in the end, all the other details that come later is to stabilize the foundation. Uh, just as the commentary for Statement 15 says, you know, in the context of the four empowerments, the three higher empowerments uh, is just teasing out uh, the full implications of the first empowerment. Likewise, in the three vows, uh, the highest, uh, the quote-unquote highest Vajrayana uh, Samaya, uh, the Bodhisattva commitment, they are elaborations of the Hinayana vows of individual liberation. The essence of individual liberation vows is called not harming. So that's the single key point, not harming. So it begins with not harming yourself. And even there, we understand that, oh, not harming myself has implications on not harming others. Not harming myself has implications on not harming others. In, in a sense, it looks as if it's saying, you know, although it looks like, you know, do not kill, do not steal, do not commit sexual misconduct, and these are like, not like uh, harming others. But at first it's saying, look how it's not harming yourself. Uh, because the psychology here is based on once you understand how it will not harm yourself, then, you know, you, 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 will, you will do that first, you know, as our starting point. <laughs> so my criticism of like early on, you know, like even now I see still, you know, people say, Oh, put the mask on, you know, it will protect others. Oh, people are not so, <laughs> people are not so inspired, you know. If you say, put the mask on because it will protect you. Oh, yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> then as it turns out, you know, oh. The side effect is that, you know, when you put your mask on thinking that it will protect you, the side effect is that it, it, it will protect others. 
Then when you mature to, it's more important to protect others. Ah, then you have evolved to the Bodhisattva understanding. But it's an elaboration of the basic understanding. Do not harm. Yeah, so the, the, the foundational matters, matters. Huh? Foundational matters matter. Yeah, at least in English, we can play with this. Another bumper sticker. Foundational matters matter. Uh, it's the heart of the matter. Uh, it's at the heart of uh, what we are practicing. Yeah, so then 15 is saying, you know, and therefore, you know, uh, if you don't have this foundational matters, if you don't have the so-called non-profound instructions, you will never uh, achieve Buddha through uh, the so-called profound ones. Then, if we, if we look at this issue from a more academic point of view, more historical point of view, yeah, then we can also learn certain things, you know, because um, information on wind straps and channels, right, the subtle body, the psychic body, the Vajra body, right, the so-called Vajra body, because Jigden Sumgun defines Vajra body different from other people. Other people, Vajra body means that psychic body, the energetic body. Jigden Sumgun says, no, the Vajra body is, is the actual uh, state of the body, you know, which is sort of the Mahamudra understanding. Anyway. This winds, drops, and channels, uh, this kind of uh, instructions, we know it exists outside the context of Buddha Dharma. Well, in a neutral context, it's in the medical texts. They talk about that. Then, competing spiritual traditions also utilize those techniques. Not that we're saying other spiritual traditions are not as good as our spiritual tradition. Yeah, not that we're saying that. But however, you know, if we understand the problem to be in this way and the solution to be in this way, yeah, which is, what is the problem? Dukkha. What is the solution? The end of Dukkha. For those purposes, it sets Buddha Dharma different from how other spiritual traditions uh, understand the problem and the solution. Uh, so they might also use winds, drops, and channels, but it's geared at, it's aimed at different results. And so, so from that perspective, you know, uh, information and training and practices on winds, drops, and channels won't necessarily take you to a state of Buddha if you did not first understand those foundational matters. If you think that the problem is, right, uh, separated from God, right, then you practice winds, drops, and channels in order to become one with God. Well, it will lead to that result. <laughs> you know, however you conceive of this God. Because practicing wind drops and channels can also help you, like uh, uh, move energy away from the focus on this body, and then take you to a godly experience. But that's not necessarily uh, seeing uh, the poisons and abandoning the poisons 
and then developing the qualities. Yeah. At least uh, on the level of what we can see the differences are. You know, at the same time, I always say, as to finally, you know, all these spiritual traditions, yeah, where they lead to, it could well be the same result. I don't know. I've never been there. <laughs> I've never been there even following the Buddhist program, you know, much less following the Hindu program, much less following the Muslim program, much less following the Christian program. How do I know? <laughs> but at least on the relative level of how each spiritual tradition articulates, you know, what is the problem and what is the solution, there are, you know, important and meaningful differences. And I don't necessarily feel that, you know, mixing all them together is good. Uh, then it's like, you know, especially those of you who are medical doctors will know, you cannot take, you know, prescription from <laughs> different doctors and mix it together, you know. Unless you are trained as a doctor, then you can know, you know, if there are counter effects of things and you can sort these things out, but majority of us don't have that ability. Now, of course, you know, great masters, you know, would always emphasize that in the end, you know, it's the Buddha qualities is, and that's also good because we also don't want to go around. Mine is right, mine is best, yours is not so good, you know. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Digress. So 516, it says, experience and realization that is incompatible with Buddha's instructions is false. Uh, so now it comes back to uh, 16 and 17. Uh, that is these, these two statements. 16, 17, 18. These three statements taken together uh, should be taken together because they, they all three of them address this tension, uh, definitely, uh, on um, where, where, how do we figure out, you know, like who to listen to, so to say. Do I listen to my own uh, instincts, so to say, or my own hunches, you know, my own kind of experience? Do I listen to yeah, the, the text that we all agree yeah, that, oh, Buddha spoke these words? Or do I listen to my teacher's special instructions? Right? So, so there's at least three possible areas. And in each area, it's a little fuzzy too. Right? Because it's not so clear, right? Even like, say, my own experience. Well, how much of that my own experience is my own experience and how much of that my own experience is based on what I've read and what I have heard, right? So no, there's there's no absolute category called my own experience, my own uh, 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 insights. But generally, you can say that's one domain. Eh? Like I often say, you have to trust your process. I mean, it's a nice statement. And then I think generally it is true. That's why I say that to you. But if you go, you know, you stand far enough, that advice is pretty good. But when you lean more into it, you're like, mm hmm, <laughs> how much of this process should I trust? I'm sure some of you, uh, whenever I said that, you're like, yeah, what can you, you know, give me a, a thermometer, you know, that I can stick into my own experience and know when it's too hot or when it's just the right degree, right? Or when we have statements like, you know, we have to rely on the Buddha's teachings. It, it sounds good and it is true, you know, but then when you zoom into it, you're like, well, which ones are the Buddha's teachings and which ones are not, right? So if you talk to your friends who practice predominantly in the Pali tradition, they will say, oh, I don't know, this Mahayana stuff, you know, that all came much later. Nothing to do with the historical Buddha. Yeah. Uh, then if you talk to like the 
those who practice in the Zen or Chinese tradition or Japanese tradition, then they say, oh, I, I don't know, this, this, all this Tantra stuff, I, it's kind of weird, you know. We, we don't really look at those things, right? So then it gets more complicated. Then there's the category of like, oh, your teacher's instructions. Yeah, especially in the, in the Gagyu, there's a lot of emphasis on like the teacher's like uh, pith instructions. And in fact, if you remember the story, it is said that Gampopa, after training for a long time in the Kadampa tradition, when he went to Milarepa, yeah, Milarepa said, ah, what you have is insufficient. Then Gampopa thought, you know, oh, you don't understand. People say we Kadampas don't have uh, Vajrayana. Oh, we have, we have. I, in fact, I receive, you know, uh, Vajrayogini or, or Chakasamvara, I think not Vajrayogini. He received Chakasamvara from one of his Kadampa masters. He probably, you know, uh, told Milarepa then. Milarepa said, yeah, I know, you know, but that's not, hmm? that's just the surface stuff. Uh, he says, what you Kadampas are lacking, he said, is the pith instructions. And what that means is like, you know, from the teacher's uh, uh, realization, which is verified by the teacher's teacher, which is verified by the teacher's teacher, right? So like personal instructions of realized beings is what Pith Instructions is talking about. So then Kampopa said, oh, and then he received those instructions from Milarepa, and then he achieved the results in ways that his Kadampa masters wasn't able to, right? So now, pith instructions, then you're like, oh. But then, what is or what is in the pith instructions, it's also hard to measure, right? So 16, 17, 18 is dealing with this set of issues. And I want to say outright that it's not clear cut, it's not black and white. We should not approach this like, you know, like um, uh, an accountant, you know, <laughs> balancing your profit and loss statements. It doesn't work like this. Yeah, this is like 16, 17, 18 will uh, give us prompts, uh, I like to call that, uh, reference points. Uh, in case we get too carried away following pith instructions, uh, we, we have to come back and say, you know, wait, mainly what did Buddha teach? Hmm? Are these like special instructions so special until, you know, <laughs> it's gone from the main points? Uh, be careful about that. Now, let's look at 16. Experience and realization that is incompatible with the Buddha's instructions is false. So these are two technical terms, experience and realization. We're not talking about how we use these words in English or in Spanish on a day-to-day -day basis. Here we're talking about, uh, on, on the, in the context of the path, uh, as in meditation practice, there are two types of what we could say experiences. Uh, one is called Nyam, uh, which is experiences, and one is called Tokpa, which is realization. So particularly in Mahamudra, uh, one set of experiences, Nyam, are the experience of bliss, the experience uh, yeah, of clarity, and the experience of non-thought. So in our uh, concise fivefold practice, those words say, you know, uh, if you remember, it says, you know, when uh, the experiences of bliss, clarity, and non-thought dawns as primordial wisdom, uh, that line. There is talking about experiences of bliss, Experiences of uh, clarity, sharpness of thought, and experiences of 
freedom from the tyranny of thoughts. Those are all experiences. When those experiences ripen into, uh, go beyond themselves, right, because those experiences are actually the height of the three realms. The, the three realms is another way of dividing samsara. Uh, the form, the, the sensual realm. Uh, so in the sensual realm, uh, the experience of like pleasure or bliss uh, is what predominantly beings are seeking. So right now we are seeking that experience of pleasure or bliss through means, through ways uh, that ultimately bring more suffering. So you can do meditation practice that actually brings a type of bliss that is at the height of what the sensual realm can give you. But nonetheless, it's still part of samsara. So that's the experience of bliss. Then the experience of clarity belongs to the height of the second realm, which is called the realm of form. And their form is not talking about like our flesh and blood form. It's really talking about like pure forms. So these are like the higher God realms. They're the lower God realms, which is part of the six, part of the, the sensual realm. In fact, there are six levels of the gods that is part of the sensual, uh, karma loka, uh, the sensual realm. Then rupa loka is the realm of forms. Then, so at the height of the realm of forms is the experience of, you know, uh, clarity. Because there in the realm of form, the mind uh, is so refined uh, that it's clear and luminous. So it says that at the top of this realm, the gods are so bright, uh, poetically. Uh, their lights uh, are so brilliant uh, because the mind is so refined. But nonetheless, it's still samsara. Uh, it's just as far as you can go within that realm. Enlightenment is outside of all these three realms. The third one is the formless realm. And that's the highest category in samsara. In the formless realm, even consciousness has become so refined until it's practically not existing in the way that you and I know. And that is the experience of non-thought. The experience of how thought no longer has power over us. But that too is the height, the best, so to say, that you can go in samsara. Enlightenment is beyond this. And that's the realization that we're talking about. Yeah, realization is beyond even these three uh, super experiences that you can reach within samsara. Uh, bliss, clarity, or luminosity, and non-thought. In this statement here, it's saying, yeah, if you think you have some of these meditative experiences, or even if you think you have like realizations, but if what you experience and realize is incompatible with the, what the Buddha has taught, then it's false. It's wrong. So here this statement is uh, uh, complexifying uh, my point of uh, trust your process, you know? Yes, trust your process, but within uh, the caveat of also understand that your process, you know, you cannot trust in the sense of like everything you experience, you think, oh, that must be true. 
Yeah? All that must be right. Because if it contradicts what the Buddha has taught, then there are problems with your experience. So this statement is, is, is more explicitly, this statement is said by Kyoba Rinpoche in response to, people claim that if something is experienced or realized that was not taught in the instructions of the Buddha and the treatises, meaning like the commentaries of the great Indian masters, then it is a quote-unquote special dharma. <clears throat> so especially in the context of 12th century, Gilbert Rinpoche's time, there were many people who went around saying, I have a special dharma. Then, then if people ask, you know, uh, uh, where, where in the authoritative text does it talk about these special dharma? You're like, oh no, this is from a special realization. So then Kyobaran Buddha said, no, we have a common reference point, which is those, those texts, those sutras that we have kind of generally everyone accepts that those are the teachings of the Buddha. He says, if it contradicts that, you know, then it's not, it's not the Buddha's teachings. Commentary. Various experiences occur through particular gatherings of the constituents while practicing the path. Yeah. So again, here, experience is a technical term. Yeah? So it's saying, you know, uh, the constituents, right? meaning like the different elements, yeah? when they come together, they can give rise to some kind of uh, unusual meditative experiences. And some people experience things such as impeding prophecies by Mara. So these are like visions people might have. And perceptions, experiences, or dreams, and so on. However, such occurrences are not found in the Buddha's instructions or are incompatible with them. Such things are not found in the Buddha's instructions, are not elucidated by those scholars who comment on the Buddha's intention and have not been experienced by earlier siddhas. Nevertheless, concerning these, some people saying, quote, such things have occurred in my perception, my experience, my dreams, unquote. Grasp their confused mind's experiences as valid and then lead their followers on such a path. So these are like teachers who say, you know, I have a special understanding. And then moreover, he says, you know, uh, non-Buddhists who possess clairvoyance through investigation remember 500 previous lives and no more. Uh, so even uh, it's possible to practice training your mind uh, outside the context of Buddhist practice where you can, in fact, have access to 500 previous lifetimes. But the point here is that 500 previous lifetimes, that's not reliable. But you and I, you know, if somebody says, oh, in your last life, oh, we get very excited, you know. And it's like, big deal, you can see one lifetime? Big deal, not in the sense of like, big deal, I can see 10 lifetimes. No, I cannot see any. But you're telling me you can see my last life. If you really understand the Buddha's teachings, you're like, yeah, you can see one lifetime, but you don't know what's before for that. Uh, and all the conditions, uh, and before, and before, and before, and before. Uh, thus saying that thereby they have determined the beginning of life, they hold the view of limits of the past. Uh, uh, so some, you know, some will say, oh, I can see 500 lifetimes, and that is where everybody started. Uh, but the saying here is like, no, it's just you cannot see beyond 501. So then you come up with the conclusion that there's a limit to past. Meaning, oh, it all started 7 billion years ago. It says, no. It means your powers can only go as far back as 7 billion. 
Moreover, some say they perceive 500 future lives, and since they do not perceive more than that, they have thereby determined the end of life, holding the view of the limits of the future. Oh, all beings after five more hundred lives, that's it, they all become Buddhas. It's like, no. <laughs> it's just because your limit is seeing 500, you know, all this and most of the wrong views, tenets, and experiences of the non-Buddhists are instances of practice faults of people who were previously Buddhists. Okay, this term Buddhist, non-Buddhist is very loaded in English, but in the Tibetan, it doesn't have the connotation that we have, uh, or doesn't necessarily have that connotation, as in the mere label, you know. Oh, I'm Buddhist. Oh, why? Oh, well, I was born in blah, blah, in Cambodia. I'm Buddhist, you know. No, no, not in that way. Here is talking about uh, the the word in Tibetan is Nangpa. Nangpa are those who follow the Buddha's Dharma. Yeah, Nangpa means uh, insiders. Uh, the deeper meaning is you know those who understand that suffering and happiness is an inside job, <laughs> as we say. Yeah. Happiness and suffering is an inside job. Yeah. So here when it says non-Buddhist, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, talking about, oh, Catholics. Yeah. Oh, this is the mistake of the Catholics. Yeah. This is the mistake of the Sunni Muslims or whatever, you know, it's not, not talking about that. Yeah. They're talking about people who practice yeah. things, yeah. but lacking the understanding that the Buddha Dharma provides. So even though they train their minds, it's not based on a clear understanding, a complete understanding of what is the problem and what is the solution. So the false experiences of great meditators have been perfectly taught as dark Mara's activity in the Mara chapter of the large, medium, and short Pranyaparamita Sutra in the ninth section of the Ushnisha and in the Jnana Vaipulya Sutra. So Jigden uh, Chodra says, you know, in various places, you know, uh, these misleading activities of Mara uh, have been clearly explained. Furthermore, to say that the instructions of the Buddha and the meanings expressed by the scholars who comment on the Buddha's intention do not correspond to what oneself holds and therefore must be changed because they are teachings requiring further explanation and indirect allusions is false explanation and the work of Mara. So some might even say, oh, based on my own experience, you know, what the Buddha said here, oh, that needs to be changed. So this is the extreme of like, trust your own process until Buddha's words, words of the great Indian masters, you know, you throw out, you ignore. You say, no, 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 my experience, that is what I trust. <laughs> so this, this statement is basically saying, don't do that. So Dojeshara, so this is to point out, you know, this is not like some sort of sectarian chauvinism, you know, like, oh, we only read Buddhists are right, you know. Dojeshara in the note says, even otherwise worthy disciples who practice the pure pith instructions in solitude with great effort sometimes have experiences and realizations that lead them astray. They deceive themselves thinking, I experience and realize such marvelous meaning in my mental continuum. Such a good experience arises in me, unquote, and say that their experience and realization is therefore supremely profound. Yeah, so... <clears throat> trusting your own process has to be uh, taken and understood within the context of needing to always refer back to 
what the Buddha has taught, how the great masters that came after the Buddha have further explained it. So needing that reference point. Statement 17, one must never contradict any of the intentions of the Buddha's instructions. So what does this mean? Well, this is a variation of the last statement, but let's look at the counter view. People claim that since one realizes the meaning that requires further interpretation and the definitive meaning differently, it is sufficient for the practice to accord with one of the respective aspects. So this is apparently, there are some people who say, yeah, uh, generally, you know, like Buddha's teachings, uh, Buddha's words, right? So even in the sutras, right? There are statements that require further interpretation. And then there are some statements that is, uh, don't need further interpretation. It, it, it means what it says. And so here, uh, it seems that some people are saying uh, that uh, it is sufficient for the practice to accord with one of the respective aspects. Uh, meaning, uh, as long as it fits into one of these two categories, then it's fine. But Kyopa here is saying, no, 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 no. It needs to fit with the, the actual intention of the Buddha. Not just fitting the relative context of what he said. So this is talking about prioritizing. Yeah? So let's look at the commentary here. If you have entered the path that is from the very beginning an authentic instruction of the Buddha, then since the 84,000 Dharma teachings were taught as antidotes to the 84,000 mental afflictions of a person's mental continuum, it is impossible that they contradict one another. The reason for this is that the perfect Buddha is an honest, true and profound teacher. Therefore, to practice the complete and, and unerring vital points of the path is to practice the fivefold dharma by way of the three vows that have the same vital point. It realizes all the intentions of the Buddha in one. Fivefold dharma is the fivefold mahamudra, the three vows is the three vows. The reason for this is that there is nothing to be practiced except the root of all dharmas, the definitive meaning mahamudra. So here, the point here is this, that while there are many ways, right, many, many kind of like practices, many, many approach this and that, right, you should practice them and any of them by understanding the key point and hold on clearly to that key point, which is here, Mahamudra. And when you understand this key point, then there are no contradictions in the 84,000. So the quote, the sutras I have taught in a thousand world realms have different wordings, but the same meaning. By practicing a single word, they are all practice. Atisha says, whichever of the 84,000 collections of Dharma have been taught, they all engage in and boil down to true reality, reality as it is. Furthermore, the topics, quote, within each of the wheels of the teachings, all three are complete. So these are Vajra statements we have already looked at. Mahamudra and discipline conduct are one. And in mantra, discipline conduct is indispensable, establishes just this point. And so Chodra says, you know, so here, Mm. Uh, these differences that we find, right, within like the Buddha's instructions, 
uh, even if you look and you say oh well over here it says you know oh use like uh, seemingly right it says oh here use uh, meat and alcohol as part of your practice oh here it says don't do that then you might seem and think oh well within the context of this you can do this within the context of this you cannot do that yeah you might want to interpret the differences like that this is the the view of the the other people which says as long as within that context you know you say oh now i'm doing vajrayana so you know all the afflictive emotions are okay is it uh, uh then you don't understand the buddha's main point here called his intention like like what did he really mean so what he really meant is right all the clashes uh, uh afflicted they cause suffering and you have to abandon them once you understand that point, right? Then even in statements that seemingly say, oh, anger is fine, you know, you know how to interpret that statement. Like you can work with anger, but anger is an afflictive emotion. Self-grasping is always an afflictive emotion. But you can work with it, yes, on different levels. But it doesn't mean, oh, in Vajrayana, you know, huh? lust is okay. Oh, in Hinayana, oh, lust is bad, bad, bad. Oh, in Vajrayana, you know, getting drunk, oh, that's okay. Oh, in Hinayana, no, that's bad, bad, bad. I've seen Vajrayana teachers, you know, talking like this, really. And they're like, oh, that's that's a Hinayana hang up, they say. Like, like we we are we are post Hinayana. <laughs> you know? We should not have such, you know, limiting views. They, they talk like that, you know. But Gyoba would be like wrong. <laughs> you don't understand the Buddha's intentions. When you understand the Buddha's intention, yeah, then you know that Buddha is not saying, oh, for you guys, I will allow this. Oh, for you guys, no, 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 I don't allow this. The notes there on 17 is quite extensive. Uh, Sobish has brought up uh, uh, quite a bit, but uh, I'm not going to go into that now. We might return to it. I want to look at 18 so that we have a more, uh, I said 16, 17, 18 should be read together. 18, it ought not to be as the pith instructions. It ought to be as the Buddha's instructions. Uh, the translation may be a little awkward. <laughs> well, it's like, it's basically saying, don't get carried away by pith instruction, pith instruction, and forget Buddha's instructions. So this is addressing maybe a um, problem, especially within uh, Mahamudra communities, because there's tremendous emphasis, right, in Mahamudra, in Dzogchen, on the teacher's pith instructions, right? Milarepa told Kampopa, the problem is you have the general things. Sure, you receive empowerment, but you did not get the pith instructions. And that, why? Because you Kadampas don't have that. <laughs> Milarepa said that, you know. So you can imagine, right? And then there are these followers of Milarepa and Gampopa hmm? uh, that, that 
and like get too excited over pith instructions. So this statement, you can just imagine in Kyopas community, his disciples may be saying to each other, I got the Lama's pith instructions, meaning, you know, I got like the the real like um, personalized instructions that Chikten Sumgun gave me. And very excited, you know. Then Kyoba Rinpoche, and Jitin Sumgun says, mm -mm -mm -mm. Buddha's instructions is most important. If you don't have that, you know, even these pith instructions, they can lead you astray. Yeah, so it's to balance out uh, overemphasizing my own experience, my guru's special instruction, yeah, the pith instructions, yeah, and always go back to uh, the Buddha's instructions. Then in terms of the Buddha's instruction, the uh, statement 17, Always remember what is his main point, what is his key instruction, what is that one dharma, so that when you understand that, then you won't like make the mistake of picking and choosing, picking the contradictions that you like, and throwing out the contradictions that you don't like. The problem is there are no contradictions. That's where your mistake is. You think that there are contradictions, then you then of course then once you think that there are contradictions, yeah, then you're gonna pick those contradictions that go along with your confusion because it feels good. <laughs> then you're gonna throw out those contradictions that don't agree with you. But if you first understand that no, there are no contradictions. Well, or Maybe contradiction is not a good term here. Maybe we can say there are no double standards. Yeah, it's not like, you know, oh, it's allowed here, it's not allowed there. There are no double standards. It's the same standard. Cause and effect is the same standard. Yeah, so back to the, you know, like the Captain passion you know which we looked at quite a bit right in different contexts right it's not like you know captain compassion was so advanced and somehow karma doesn't apply anymore no absolutely not it only meant that you know not only it's a great thing you know it meant that he has evolved to a point where even though there is suffering, he could handle it. For the sake of others, even though there is suffering, he could handle it. But compare his decision and his action to a higher bodhisattva or even to a Buddha, then it is unskillful to have to kill. Yeah. So it's complex. It's not reduced to like right, wrong either. Yeah. Don't want you to have the impression that Jigden Sumgun is a dogmatist. <laughs> right, wrong. He's also not talking about that. If you look at his life story, you know, his earliest biography, it says, you know, he had so many like realizations you know the light the light bulb coming on but then he realized later oh there's more to penetrate there's more to break through there's more to break through there's more to break through so likewise you know with our understanding like currently we understand it this way yeah then there's more to break through and more to break through and it's not so easy to grasp all of this and so at the same time you know don't don't like try to like get it it's not so easy to just get it uh, if you can so easily get it we're not here anymore you know or not we're not here in this way anymore <laughs> yeah we'll be here in a very different way
Yeah, so these are the three statements, you know, I think uh, Sobish's uh, notes give us more kind of uh, interesting uh, context and explanations to consider, which we will go back uh, to looking at those, especially for statement 17. Uh, there's a lot of um, more specific uh, vocabulary, so I'm not going to go into those vocabulary today. Um, Any questions, comments? 16, 17, 18. So, okay, so quickly yeah, in the notes for 518. Uh, in the notes for the 518, it says, we may assume that the following arguments are also directed against piss instructions of a certain kind, namely those based on intellectual understanding or experience of ordinary biased beings. Here, ordinary being certainly refers to a broad spectrum of people. However, the intention is not to devalue pith instructions as such. This Vajra statement is primarily about possible tensions between Buddha's words and other masters' pith instructions. In such cases, the Buddha words has precedence. The Buddha's words have to carry more weight. The Buddha's instructions are superior to Pith instructions because he has the authority of all phenomena. A formulation that appears several times in our text. The commentators here define the, that authority as being without veils concerning all objects of knowledge, that is, omniscient. So therefore, what the Buddha taught, he taught based on him seeing everything. Whereas the great masters, yeah, even if they are more helpful to us directly, because, you know, in theory, you could meet these individuals in the way that you cannot meet, you know, Gautama, you know, Shakyamuni in person. But uh, as useful as uh, what a teacher can, you know, give you directly, meaning like uh, uh, tailor, right, the Buddha's principle into your circumstance. But that tailoring, you know, if somehow it leads to like contradicting the Buddha's basic principle, then you should go back to the basic principle is what it is saying. So it also, in some ways, I would say, it also, what it means here is that, you know, to me at least, because the all-knowing Buddha has taught so extensively in so details, huh? so if you look at all the, you know, the like for example, the Buddha word, uh, words of the Buddha, as accepted in the Tibetan tradition, uh, called the Gangyu. Uh, so 84,000 uh, is the translation project to translate all of this, right? So if you look at that collection, it's a huge collection. So in a way you can say, when you receive what's known as a pith instruction, right? Something that is specific to your situation, that instruction that comes to you from a trusted teacher with like experience with you know all of that knowledge realization that that instruction should be verifiable somewhere in this big collection known as the buddha's words because the Buddha has taught so extensively. So that if a master gave something that is ultimately not verifiable from this body, then, you know, uh, it's a little <laughs> uh, uncertain, risky. And so we should not rely on that. 
Yeah, so these three statements are particularly important within a community that so emphasizes uh, pith instructions. So it's Kilbarimbich's way of like tempering that excitement, you can say, you know, and say, hey, 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 you know, we emphasize a lot of meditating because see, in contrast to like a more scholarly tradition, a more scholarly tradition, right, they will debate and say, no, you know, you say this, but in this text, this text, this text, this text, it says this, 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 this. And so you, you work out the contradictions. But in a meditative, contemplative tradition that emphasizes your looking at your own mind, right? It's easy to get carried away when you're looking at your own mind. And then your confusion, you think, is your realization. And then you say, oh, I have realized something that is not in the text. Say, so, ah, now be careful. <laughs> as much as the contemplative tradition, uh, sometimes you can say poo-poo, right? Downplays, right? Studying. Be careful. Uh, as much as the contemplative tradition, the forest tradition, for example, in Thailand, uh, and the Kagyupa, early Kagyupas, that rely on the master, be careful. It cannot contradict the established kind of what we know and accept, oh, these are the Buddha's words, and these are the commentaries of the Indian masters. So that's the main point yeah, in these three statements here. It's particularly necessary for uh, Gagyupa, you know, uh, meditative, contemplative traditions that don't emphasize a lot of studying. Those who emphasize a lot of studying, you know, when you say, oh, the pith instructions say this is this, immediately they say, wait, uh, no. <laughs> you know? They can say that, you know. And that's good, you know. Then, of course, for like someone like Kyoba Rinpoche, you know, you, you can kind of imagine this scenario playing out, you know. If Kyoba Rinpoche is giving an instruction, right, then maybe that disciple has studied a lot, you know, and the disciple will say, wait, no, I, uh, according to this, according to that, I'm sure Kyoba Rinpoche will be able to point further and say, well, actually, you think what I'm saying contradicts, so here. Let's lay it all out clearly, and then you even yeah, the the learned ones will see. Oh, right, this is you know uh, a further point. So, which is to say, it is good to learn hmm, to the degree that you know we can. Of course, each of us have different situation yeah, conditions. To the degree that we can, we should know right, the categories. Yeah, how it is uh, kind of explained in the scholastic tradition, in the scholarly tradition, uh, in the shedras, uh, in the analysis that is found, you know. So a number of you, uh, for years, I know you have attained, attended these classes uh, through Tibet House and Casa Tibet and, and very systematic, you know, studying of texts like the way it's done in the shedra. That is really good. It has given you, you know, uh, a good uh, safety net. Uh, so that when you listen more to the Kagyupa contemplative, uh, experiential based, uh, you, you have the safety net of that, you know, um, more conventional <laughs> uh, reference point. For those of you without that, you know, you listen to this a lot of times, I can, you know, not a lot of times later, I can, I realize, oh my God, uh, they took it in a different direction. <laughs> because, because you didn't have, you know, uh, the more common reference point. Uh, you, you heard something, you took it yeah, 
to your confusion and you fed your confusion. <laughs> because the more contemplative ones are more evocative. So they can say things that, you know, you think, oh, yes, yes, I understand. But if, if you lack, you know, a common reference point, then it becomes kind of treacherous, dangerous. It's like walking on ice, you know. If you know how to walk on ice, we call that skating. Oh, la, 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 you know, effortless. If you don't know how to walk on ice, we call that, you know, falling and a lot of pain. <clears throat> Slipping. <laughs> Questions, comments? <laughs> yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I keep going back to the story of the captain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd, like, uh, I'd like to know if uh, my understanding is uh somewhat correct about mm -hmm. this incident yes uh we we can't label the act of the captain good or bad because both negative and car and positive karma were were generated he killed mm -hmm. which is contrary to the teaching he did generate good karma because he saved all of the arhats but no, both the, the, the bodhis office okay but yes. both of the both good karma and bad karma arose from that act. It cannot be labeled strictly one or the other. Yes. Okay. Uh, the captain gets the results both of the good karma and the bad karma. They both yes. come. Yes. Um, and if the captain were more skilled, he wouldn't have had to kill the assassin. He would have found a way to save the situation without killing. If he'd been a perfect Buddha, he might have been able to stop the assassin without killing him. Yes. Okay. And in the end, because of all this is consistent, the Buddha's teachings are superior to that of any other being. We, we yes. can't. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Then in within that discussion, you know, we also looked at uh, the Bodhisattva Bhumis, you know, and saying that the captain at that point was at the sixth Bhumi, I think, somewhere in one of the commentaries to one of the lines it, when they're talking about the Bhumis. Uh, that, that line about how at the sixth Bhumi, um, the, the main, the, the, the core realization there is the realization of uh, all phenomena as um, projections of mind. And therefore, from that perspective, um, if you want to look at it from how that is nonetheless, you know, Captain Compassion story is nonetheless a, a uh, story to be told and to be understood and to learn, is to learn that at the level of six Bhumi, when he fully understood that all phenomena is mind, that made it possible for him uh, to experience the hell realms due to the ripening of karma. In that sense, he is no different from us. Yeah? Karma will ripen. But um, his realization that all experiences of a mind, in a way, also made it easier for him to experience the hell realm. That did not derail him. Otherwise, if you and I were dropped into the hell realm uh, for having, you know, done that, we would blame and regret yeah, that action and say, "Oh, I should have minded my own business." You know, it's not my problem. You know, this guy wants to kill everyone. You know, <laughs> then we would have been derailed from our bodhisattva vow. You know, but kept in compassion, you know, having achieved the sixth Bhumi. So, yes, objectively, it said that he was reborn in the hell realms, but subjectively, he had the understanding everything is mine, not just theoretically, not just intellectual. And, and therefore, the hell realms was experienced differently in a way.
So that's part of also the, that story has so many sides to it. And, and from that point of view, you can say, you cannot say it's good or you cannot say it's bad. But that story serves as uh, very instructive on various aspects of the path that we need to understand. So in the end, for me, that story, I don't even need to think of it as actually the story of someone who happened uh, in this way. But rather, the story is a powerful way to understand you know, all the different complex issues uh, related to um, causality, related to, to uh, emptiness, related to mind only, uh, or, or all of this. Dr. Lai? Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you, or maybe one of my, our classmates here, um, mm -hmm. is there like a, like a visual chart that you or anyone has, mm -hmm. maybe about the, the three realms and other things? It's just- What, what do you mean? Like, like a chart. I know the book here and there has little charts, but just charts, like a visual aid that talks about like the six, six the, the three realms, and the different categories, like a sheet sheet that just kind of has all of that together. Oh, you can look around and see what you find. <laughs> I know, but I was wondering if anyone had it here, uh, a good one no, that I would recommend. If you put the work in, you know, and then you find it, it's like, oh, I will never forget. Okay. <laughs> but I tell my students when they ask me for sheet sheets. Yeah, you know, you come up with it, then you verify. And then in the process of verifying, it becomes clear, you know. Okay, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay. Chan Chu Sam Chu Ma ge ba nam ge gu chi ge ba nyam ba me ba ya go ne gong du be wa sho In one of my classes in graduate school uh, with the uh, famous uh, to some people right now maybe not that many people know about him. Uh, Jeffrey Hopkins, one of the pioneers in the West in the study of Tibetan Buddhism, particularly Tibetan Buddhist uh, seminary style, uh, all the classifications and everything. In a class that I took with him in graduate school, he did precisely that. He will teach the different systems. And then he said, uh, first assignment, create a chart that brings together all these systems. And then we got graded on that. Uh, and he says, put together this system, this system, this system, this system. And so we worked on it. And as we worked on it, it becomes clear what we know or we don't know, you know? And then we got graded on it. You know? uh, including a charting of like, deity yoga according to the first of the four tantras kriya tantra action tantra way of um, talking about the steps the deity inside the deity's heart there is a deity inside the deity's heart there's another deity then there's a deity in front inside of the deities in front heart there's another deity all of that, you know, he says, you chart it out, then bring to class and then pass that chart around. Uh, and then, yeah, so. <laughs> Happy charting, ta-ta. Thank you. Thank you.